The other thing that you should be aware of is it's, it's not exactly arbitrary, but the, the nature of departmental boundaries keeps, keeps changing. So if you look at the current government, they have put uh, education into a super portfolio um, of um, check my notes here, right? education, employment, and workplace relationships. So education has been given a higher status. Before, as often, it was an add-on to other departments. Um, and interestingly, uh, in terms of education, research has been taken away from education and there's a portfolio that Kim Carr is in charge of, of innovation, industry, science and research. So people are often moving between different areas, departments get reorganised and as a result, and also ministers keep changing. So this, often there's implications this in terms of public servants having to brief ministers who to try to get up to speed about a topic. Another really important thing to think about in terms of uh, what has happened in the last 20 years in the government sector around the world is the call for small government is good government. Um, we, we've just had a, a session with the graduate students talking about the corporate sustainability papers that Neil Gunningham uh, gave us to read. And we kept coming back to the fact that there is a role for government in terms of setting up regulation, in terms of encouraging processes for the community to participate. But particularly as a result of, uh, of Margaret Thatcher in the UK, of Reagan in the US and Howard in Australia, there's a very strong uh, pull between those three of small government is good government and that we should let the market decide things in terms of how we manage uh, things such as the environment. Um, there's been a tendency in government over the last 20 years of outsourcing. So instead of a department having the resources to manage uh, a policy area, they hire consultants to do it. And uh, I can't be too critical of consultants because I've been one to government, but having worked in government and one of my main jobs was to employ, brief, and then find out the results of consultants. There are some real problems in terms of using consultants in government. Because what happens is, uh, what is lost is, is corporate knowledge, corporate memory. So people talk about the memory that can be built up in an organisation and an organisation can learn as it goes along. But if you get um, a uh, consultants or ways to come in and to, to do that work, often what they'll do is just reinvent the wheel and suggest something that was perhaps rejected four years ago for very good reasons. If they do spend a long time in the area and build up a knowledge, then they will move on some, sometime in the future and that knowledge is uh, lost. Another tendency in government that you need to be uh, conscious of in terms of its implications for environmental policy and planning is the idea of managerialism. So often now people at senior levels are expert managers, they're not expert in the content, le the content knowledge. So you might have somebody, and this is a real example, who's been in charge of broadcasting policy, fishing policy and transport policy. Okay, so they're an excellent manager, have really good skills, but they couldn't pretend to be an expert always in terms of those knowledge. So like a politician, they're going to have to rely on briefs um, from individuals. So politicians get briefed all the time. If you're working in, um, as a public servant, you'll be asked um, to write possible parliamentary questions. Uh, so it, as a public servant, you're protecting the minister and anticipating what questions might be written, uh, might be asked that day in parliament. And the same thing might happen, might happen in terms of senior managers in government. So just to quickly finish this sort of a quick review of what government does in terms of policy, we just need to think about the role of government departments in developing policy. So it can formalise proposals into policy documents. So a Prime Minister uh, uh, might say something in an election campaign saying we'll do X. And X doesn't happen unless that policy is implemented, developed into a formal proposal, developed into legislation, developed into a program that's implemented. So those proposals need to be turned into legislation and they need to be implemented. So three different ways in which governments can be involved in policy. And I've mentioned already this fact that governments are always changing, so, uh, and the structure of governments are always changing, there's implications of this. Uh, and this often gives public servants a huge amount of power and influence. Those of you uh, who are uh, old enough will remember the British comedy series Yes Minister, which has become sort of a classic in, uh, with bureaucrats because it's seen as being so true to the bone, and those who haven't seen it, it's about a, about a senior bureaucrat who's always pulling the wool over the, um, over the minister's or the prime minister's eyes. So Humphrey is the senior bureaucrat. He has a wonderful line in one program saying, all politicians are required to do is look plausible, stay sober, and say the lines that we give them in the right order. So it's all about 
the influence that public servants can have over their ministers. So if a minister is um, having to read that much paper every night, there's no way they can be on top of everything. They're really reliant on the people working for them. And the people uh, from this course have gone on, many of them, not, every, not everybody, but many of them have really enjoyed that role of being in government and having the capacity to influence change. It doesn't suit everybody. Some people actually really hate it in terms of working in government and being in those very formal and quite uh, formalised ways of having to work. So it doesn't suit everyone, and not everyone uh, probably uh, in most cases are going to do that for their whole lives, but there's, I think, a really important uh, contribution people like yourselves can make in working effectively in government. I've already mentioned DASIT and how it kept uh, the Department of Arts, Sports, Environment, Territories and Tourism, and it kept changing its name when I worked for them in the early 90s. And every time it changed its name, they had to throw out all their letterhead. They usually got a different minister. Uh, I was there for, uh, in, in six years, there was eight different ministers uh, working in, the, uh, in that area. And each time, you'd have to give them a brief. You'd have to say, these are the key issues. They're always learning about their job. And some of the good, some of them get on, some are incredible. They could get on top of a brief really quickly. And others weren't so good. And, and they're always uh, happy to be briefed. So there's this influence to change and influence the process. Um, in the uh, late 90s, early, early 2000s, I ran a field trip each year to Victoria, going down the Murray-Darling Basin. And every year, the, uh, the Victorian department responsible for the environment had changed its name. So it became a bit of a joke that CNR changed for constant name, constant name replacement in uh, this Victorian department. But again, it had implications. Um, natural resources, environment, often there's a tension between those, which is quite understandable in terms of different approaches to government. So when you look around Australia and look at the state, and federal government systems. Have a look at the words and have a look at how different areas are grouped and whether industry, resource use, resource management issues such as forestry, agriculture and fisheries are linked with environmental issues or separated. And to link them is a very different statement in terms of how you manage the environment than having them separate. So this is a nice quote from a book I mentioned last week. Glyn Davis was a senior advisor in the Queensland government, very close to the current Prime Minister when he was there, worked close with him, and he's now the Vice-Chancellor of Melbourne University. Uh, but he wrote a classic book, if you're interested in public policy, uh, called Public Policy in Australia. And he talks about how the average cabinet minister is an overworked generalist with little detailed knowledge of his or her portfolio, fighting a losing battle to stay on top of the paperwork and conflicting demands of their time. As one minister noted to him, the sheer volume is quite enormous. It's nothing to count two linear feet of cabinet documents home. With 20 or more items scheduled for each meeting, another cabinet that admitted they read only 10% of their cabinet submissions, submissions thoroughly. And if anyone claims to read more than, than that, he is lying. So there's implications again here of just how well briefed our ministers are, how well they understand those issues, and the huge importance in terms of those people who are briefing them. So you've looked at policy and planning in the tutorial, so I'd like you just to, as the course develops, just think about how policy is put into place. So we've talked about advocacy, we've talked about pressure groups, about uh, NGOs advocating something should happen, so that's obviously one way that policy gets initiated, not necessarily always put into place. Uh, I've talked about policy being put in place through money and tied grants. So again, the land care example I mentioned last week, I think that federal government can give money to the state governments and say, you have to spend this on X or Y. So it's one way in the Australian system that the feds can have some control over the states. You can have policy put in, in place through government action, and you can also have through law. So I won't go into that in more detail now, but it's kind of structured to think about as, as you are running particular tutorials, to think about your example, which example of those is your, um, is your example? What does it, which of those does it fall under? And just in terms of advocacy, I mentioned last week the rise of industry lobby groups and, um, and a lot of people argue in the 70s it was actually the peak of, effect, of the effectiveness of community-based environmentalism and that since then the community has been outdone by greenwashing, by the corporate sector using many of the tactics that environment organisations themselves developed. If you're interested in following this through, there's a really very interesting book written by a an academic from Wollongong, Sharon Better, called Global Spin, and quote, she says, once they realised, these are the, uh, in, this is industry, how the political scene had changed, corporations began to adopt the strategies that public interest actives had used so effectively against them. 